Good afternoon to you. Mark out of HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for Monday, February the 3rd, 2020. Let's start off the tour today by looking at the anomalies for the Western Hemisphere, the Tropical Pacific down here, and of course the Tropical Atlantic over here. And if we compare the two, this is running more warm than this. Does that make sense? The anomalies here uh, are warmer and more widespread than any warm anomalies over in the Pacific. And to point some things out that, you know, just a few details, we've got these small blobs of cold anomalies starting to show up, overall generally neutral through a good chunk of the eastern Pacific. Pretty warm right against the coast of South America. That's a typical, this is the Nino 1-2 area. But then as you spread further to the west, out that direction, a little bit warmer than average. But overall, if you compare the two basins, the Atlantic over here, A for Atlantic, P for Pacific, the Atlantic is generally warmer than is the Pacific. Uh, and you can just look and see. I mean, there it is. My eyes don't deceive me. A uh, large area of cold anomalies in the southern Pacific, South Pacific, and a large area off the west coast of the United States. And just marginally warmer than average here across across the equatorial region. Uh, and so, again, I'm going to hold my stance that any thoughts of El Nino happening in 2020, uh, from what I am seeing, I just it doesn't appear likely. And if we add to that the subsurface anomalies here at this GIF animation that's looping, uh, this goes back to the latter part of uh, 2019, and then through the latter days of January, this takes about a week to update. It's always lagging behind, and I always have to ad-lib my way through this animation. But you can see in the subsurface this very large area of cold anomalies starting to uh, take shape and surround. It's like it's flanking, you know, in the subsurface, the uh, ever-present area of warmth. And that battle is really interesting because whichever one wins will determine uh, what happens to the state of the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon, for the rest of 2020. But what I find intriguing is how much real estate this cold anomaly area has gained uh, in the western and the eastern Pacific over here. And what's really telling is we're not seeing any more of these large blobs of oranges and reds, which are positive anomalies, develop over here in the West Pack. And generally how this works, I like to think of this as a conveyor belt, that generally speaking, what, what happens in the West Pack, the warm pool that's uh, pretty much always there, you get westerly winds that come across and it forces these downwelling Kelvin waves of energy and, you know, that's input into the ocean through the wind but then also through this heat transfer, and you get these blobs that will move their way across the Pacific, and then the trades take over, water gets upwelled, and you bring all that warm water to the surface. Well, if below the surface, and you're seeing it now, there's just a lot of colder anomalies undercutting all this warmth, there's nothing to resupply it. And you know some of these anomalies here uh, in the West Pack, this large cold pool, you know, we're talking a degree or two Celsius below the long-term average, or whatever they measure, whatever their background state is. And so I see this, and I, and I really do believe you know, that this warmth will dwindle uh, over time, and then this cold will start to take shape, and modeling is seeing that, and I tweeted about this the other day. I mean, look at this. This is really, really interesting. The uh, CFS V2... Nino 3.4 region of the Pacific forecast out over the next several months is for it to fall off a cliff uh, into La Nina territory. And you know even the latest eight ensemble members there, which is the Palous, you can see them in there if you look closely, um, those are even more aggressive. Most of them are over on this side. You know, So it'll be really interesting as we move through February to see what the various modeling picks up on the European, uh, the ECMWF uh, model is usually warm biased. Uh, the CFS is typically, eh, I, I think it's more cold biased over time if you go back and look at its track record. And so you don't look at this and say, oop, that's what's going to happen. 
this is the forecast from this model group, this ensemble system, as of February 1st. That's when this was updated. And so we can track this. I'll be watching this with uh, great interest over the next several weeks and months, as you can imagine. But, I mean, come on. The ensemble mean there, you know, even if it comes in and it's like this, you know, just riding close to neutral, uh, you know, half these values, then that's no El Nino. And that is what is so important as a driver for the Atlantic hurricane season that, uh, let me get my color red in here, if you start to paint all this in here uh, with positive anomalies like this, you know, and that's this a pretty good job there. If you start to do this, you know, what happens? You get a lot of upward motion, air rising in the Pacific, uh, and then it sinks over in the tropics uh, in the Atlantic, spreads out, and you create sheer dry air, sinking air, etc. And it's just a big killer of these tropical waves that come off of Africa, and you typically don't have an active hurricane season in the Atlantic. It doesn't mean you won't have any hurricanes. We know all about that. But when you take the heat, an anomalous heat, out of this region of the Pacific, you really start to cut down on that upward motion. And when the Atlantic is warmer than normal on top of that, which right now it is slightly so, you know, it's not alarmingly so, not yet, um, then you really tip the balance into the, uh, you tip the scale or the balance, whichever way you want to look at it. You know, you offset that balance and it favors the Atlantic. So we'll see. We still have just, just under four months to go. But that is an interesting look, to be sure. All right. I've been watching this with great interest as well. The actual sea surface temperatures, Gulf of Mexico. Your shelf water area up here will always be a little too chilly, of course. But down here, Florida Straits, into the southeast Gulf through the uh, Yucatan Channel there. 26, 27 Celsius wintertime is on its last legs. The groundhog said so. <laughs> right? And, um, you know, the sun is getting higher in the sky every day. The sun angle is increasing, and so the incoming solar radiation, or what we call insolation, N-S-O-L, insolation, increasing, uh, meaning that the microwave in the sky is on high right now. It is. And so these water temperatures are going to start to warm. You know, we're past the cooling days. We are. You know, we could still get an Arctic outbreak that could cool off water temps up here, uh, temporarily, and it's really easy to mix up the Gulf, but this deep warmth that we're seeing down in this area coming out of the Caribbean is uh, not necessarily portending to a, uh, a more intense Gulf hurricane season, but maybe, as I mentioned the last couple of weeks, things get started a little earlier. We'll just wait and see. And the other thing that it'll do, it'll, it'll provide for ample moisture transport and energy into the lower 48, uh, as the Bermuda High sets up shop out here and funnels that wind around in a clockwise fashion, you get that return flow, and any of that deep moisture could fuel some big thunderstorms in the south, which is something we'll talk about in a few minutes. See, it all gets tied together. You have the circle of life in the animal kingdom and the circle of life and how things work literally in the hydrologic cycle uh, in the weather world as well. All right, water temperatures off the East Coast and Mid-Atlantic, as you would expect, cold along the Northeast Corridor, down to the northern part of the Outer Banks. Still pretty cold just offshore in the shelf water here further south. But again, the Gulf Stream, a marvelous uh, study in thermodynamics and oceanography. Nice and warm out there still. And the anomalies, let's just go back and check that real quick. You betcha. Those are those anomalies right in there. I'm trying to point to them. Very, very warm, three-fourths Celsius above the long-term average. Just no major nor'easters, you know, no Miller A or Miller B type storms, either the ones that cut across or the ones that come up out of the Gulf. Nothing off the coast here again. That's amazing. That's like having two hurricane seasons in a row with no hurricanes impacting the United States. It does happen. 2000, 2001 are examples, okay? But two winter seasons in a row with no major uh, powerhouse storms that get started and move up this way or just offshore past the benchmark. You know, you hear people talk about that. 
with two feet of snow and 80 mile an hour winds along the coast. We haven't had it along the eastern United States. In Newfoundland and parts of Nova Scotia you have, but just not in the lower 48. Go figure. All right, so looking at the uh, satellite imagery, just want to kind of show you a quick shot of uh, what's happening across the Atlantic. Um, deep troughing and low pressure out here over the eastern Atlantic. Westerly winds abound, uh, and high pressure is starting to build over the eastern U.S., trough out in the western United States. Clear skies around the Caribbean, nice and toasty. Sunny skies uh, down in the windwards and leewards all the way up through Puerto Rico. Just some afternoon pop-up cumulus clouds, nothing, you know, not even any identifiable tropical waves to speak of. Um, and it should stay that way. You know, that's the way it is. It's the dry season with, you know, every once in a while you get these pop-up uh, showers from time to time. And, um, you know, other than that, and you know what? Didn't I tweet this the other day? Uh, I'm going to go back to my Twitter. You know, my mind working on all kinds of things, and I forget some things. Um, I thought I did. Let's see. That's me talking about the Super Bowl. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot this. That's okay. The other day, our buddy Tim, uh, one of our patrons down in St. Thomas, uh, alerted me that there was a water spout. And I know it's really hard to see on um, crappy, compressed Twitter video, but there it is right there. This is zoomed in. That's the water spout. This is real time. The uh, the previous thing was an animation. Let's see if that's a time-lapse animation. And you can barely see it right there. It's just because of the compressed nature of the Twitter video. See it go by? And so my point is, once in a while, even when weather is fair, you get these towering cumulus clouds down there in the Caribbean. There's the water spout right there. And uh, Tim sent me a text message, and he said, Water spout on the camera! And I went and I looked, and we have these nest cams down there, one in St. John, one in St. Thomas. And I was able to go back and check it out, and there you go. Not as dramatic as what you see in the Florida Keys, but uh, at least we got to see it. And seriously, thanks, Tim, for t telling me all about it. So any water spot action today? Not likely. This is a pretty dry, clear pattern. Um, the moisture and the instability down in that region not there to produce water spouts at this time, it looks like. But you never know. You get these towering cumulus clouds, uh, not quite cumulonimbus. Those, you know, thunderstorm clouds can produce them, but it's more of those towering cumulus clouds. You see those a lot, uh, in Caribbean, you know, postcard pictures. Nevertheless, nice and clear for now. All right. Lower 48 weather, boy, look at this, and I'm going to explain why it looks like this. Stormy, winter storm, wind advisors, you name it, out west. In the east, not a big problem. A few hydrologic outlooks in these greens, because there's a lot of rain coming, and a changeable pattern for sure. Why is that happening? Well, it's because the jet stream, whoops, there we go, uh, is buckled out west. There's the trough. Ridging in the east, this will amplify amplify more. This energy will slide down, move across, actually this way. And we're going to have quite a stormy week ahead. And I can show you that on the GFS here as we slide this out uh, in time. Watch what happens out west. Hopefully you know. And, and by the way, St. Louis and Kansas City and other, you know, Cape Girardeau, those are all in Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so, And where is Missouri, just in case you want to know? Right there. There's Missouri. Okay? And there's the great state of Kansas. And Kansas City is in Missouri, technically speaking. All right? So there's your mini geography lesson for everyone. Not picking on anybody individually. Just, just saying. So that's the nation's heartland. And uh, here's the Pacific Northwest <laughs> over here. And uh, watch what happens, okay? We'll get back to, see, I threw myself off trying to be funny. Uh, storm system develops, and, you know, there's 48 hours uh, and beyond into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and that is quite the look there. Uh, and look at this. You can see these heights here really crash. I don't know what I did there. There we go. Uh, cold air draining in behind the system, warm air in front of it, so severe weather, a potential threat. Uh, for the southeast. But before that, maybe, maybe, although it's not looking likely, 
maybe some snow for parts of the Dallas metro area, but it's really going to be areas west of there along the I-20 corridor uh, towards Sweetwater and the wind farm areas out there, and then southwest of there, and then, yes, northeast of there through the heart of Oklahoma and into Kansas City, Missouri, as well as St. Louis and vicinity. Maybe some snow. We'll see. Uh, bottom line is this is a vigorous storm system. The threat of severe weather definitely rearing its head there as we get through um, late Thursday into Friday. That's the, that's the squall line of, you know, wow, good grief. My neck of the woods stretching down to the Florida Panhandle, the Big Bend area. Uh, like I said, a very potent storm system moves through. Cold air drains in behind, and that storm exits. And you, as you see, no major nor'easters just slide this through. The storms are generally progressive. It's mainly the nation's midsection here that gets pummeled with these storms. And that could lead to another big flood season this spring, something we'll take a look at probably the first week of March, uh, and maybe what we can do to monitor that in person. I'll talk about that when the time comes. I missed out on that last year. I think that was an opportunity missed to provide some immersive coverage. You know, it kind of snuck up on me. I wasn't expecting it, but this year I'm going to be on top of that. And this is the type of pattern, you know, this is 10 days out, but, you know, just one storm after another through the nation's midsection, uh, as you see there. And why? Well, a big part of it is that return flow, like I was saying, comes up out of that warm gulf, especially that warm loop current, and it feeds those storms with ample moisture. So the severe weather risk today, uh, just, you know, scattered thunderstorms there up through Texas into um, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and into Missouri. Day two, it gets a little bit more amplified with marginal conditions across parts of the Mississippi Valley. And then by day three, and this could go to higher categories later, maybe into the enhanced We'll see. That's not up to me. That's the Storm Prediction Center's role. But you see, and again, it's that deep return flow, the deep moisture feed out of that above normal gulf, especially the southeast gulf that I showed you, and that vigorous storm cutting across the makings of a nasty squall line, maybe some tornadoes, but I think it's going to be more high wind, straight line wind, hail, and very, very heavy rain in parts of the deep south. And then that threat moves into my neck of the woods at days four and maybe day five from there. We'll see. Lasting into day five. Um, so active pattern for sure as we watch the tropics. Obviously nothing percolating, but interesting things with that CFS V2 that kind of rattled everybody's cages over the weekend when I tweeted that. And I saw it posted on Storm 2K as well. People talking about it on the message boards. You know, I even saw something from Eric Blake, one of the forecasters at the Hurricane Center, uh, about the CFS and the CanSips uh, Ensemble Package. That's a Canadian uh, model package indicating a cold Pacific and a warm Atlantic and lower shear for the Atlantic. These are just things we watch for in the off season. Gives us something to do. All right? All right. Well, that is it for me for today. As always, I appreciate you tuning in. If you're watching on, well, of course you're watching on YouTube. I don't put these anywhere else, at least not yet. Uh, but if you're new to watching on YouTube, subscribe for future videos. And as the kids say on the gaming channels, hit the bell for notifications, right? And you'll be notified if you want to. If you want to be bothered when I upload a future video, you will know. I'm on Twitter, at Hurricane Track, on Patreon, at Hurricane Track. Everything's at Hurricane Track. Have a great rest of your Monday. Thanks for tuning in. I am Mark Suttoth, Hurricane Track. That's the brand. I'll talk to you again early next week.